thank you all for coming. It's, uh, it's really fantastic to see such a, a big crowd tonight and a full house. Uh, and it's great to welcome all of our uh, alumni, friends, donors, students, faculty. Um, uh, and it's good to see the house uh, full tonight. Uh, we have a very exciting program. I want to briefly um, recognize a few people and, and make some quick announcements, and then we will get to uh, the, the main event. I want to start by thanking the many GSM business partners who are here tonight. They're really part of what makes the school um, strong and connects us to the community. So I want to recognize the representatives from Kaiser Permanente, First Northern Bank, SMUD, Comstocks Magazine, Bank of the West, Digital Deployment, Five Star Bank, Lamplighter Financial, Moss Adams, Murphy, Austin, Adams, and Schoenfeld, and River City Bank. I, I hate to have to use notes, but I'm happy that the list was so long that I, I had to do that. Um, I also want to take a moment and um, thank Chancellor Katehi for attending tonight and for hosting our guest earlier in the evening, um, and really welcome all of you. Um, uh, as you know, uh, basketball has been uh, had a very big year here at UC Davis, so it's especially exciting tonight to be welcoming our guest. Uh, it's really a pleasure to give you a, a sort of brief introduction to uh, Vivek Ranadive, the uh, owner and chairman of the Sacramento Kings, and I will let him mainly tell his story. Uh, I want to also start out with um, just mentioning that the, the School of Management, it's, it's so many of you are friends of the school. We continue to have a strong program, our full-time MBA program. This year celebrated its 20th consecutive year, quite a streak of being ranked among the top 50 programs nationally. Our part-time programs rank in the top 9% of part-time MBA programs. Recently, our new kid on the block, our Masters of Accounting program, uh, we found that the graduates last year of that program ranked number one in the state on the state CPA exam. Quite an honor for a program that's only three years old. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> of course, much of tonight is going to be about technology and innovation, and so I also want to uh, give a bit of a shout out to the undergraduates we teach in our technology management minor, and of course recognize the work of really the crown jewel around innovation and entrepreneurship, which is the Child Family Institute, um, which really connects entrepreneurs and innovators with the marketplace. Um, tonight though, uh, speaking of entrepreneurship and innovation, uh, we're going to welcome someone who is really a, a sort of a, a, a bit of royalty in those areas. Uh, uh, Vivek, um, as you all know him, uh, is associated with the Sacramento Kings, but has a long history of contributions. He's been an entrepreneur, a technology visionary, a best-selling author, a philanthropist, and uh, today has joined the Sacramento community to do some important and really visionary work, both in basketball and in economic development in the region. Uh, he um, started out uh, some time ago when he developed the, uh, started a software company, uh, Technicron Software, which uh, essentially developed software that initially ran the trading markets on Wall Street and then went on to essentially run the global capital markets all over the world. From there, he took his interest and his expertise in real-time computing and big data uh, as the founder of Tibco Software which was uh, simply phenomenally successful and now powers industries from communications, manufacturing, uh, and of course, King's basketball as well. Um, a final note um, before I turn things over to our guest, he uh, says that he got his start in basketball when he was asked and reluctantly agreed to coach his daughter's middle school basketball team. Um, for all of the business students, particular in the audience, I hope you take this as a lesson that trying new things can have really incredible and amazing results uh, because today, of course, we see him in a, a very exciting role with the Kings. So with that, I'm going to uh, initiate a conversation and we have some questions for the audience at the end, but I will just okay. um, turn it over and you can tell us about your background in basketball sure. and innovation and whatever you'd like. Okay, well, thanks, uh, thanks for having me. Thanks, Linda, and thanks for a uh, fabulous dinner uh, at your house. By the way, I love the Wayne Thibos on the walls at your house. And I was trying to see if I could slip one in my car <laughs> on the way out, but you guys were like watching me closely. So, <laughs> no, it, it's it's a great honor and a great privilege to be here. And uh, you have an incredible university here, and you have amazing leaders. Uh, and there's no better time uh, to be a student than today. And there's really no better time to be alive uh, than today. And I think the next 10, 15 years are going to see unprecedented 
uh, opportunity and change, and uh, you guys are going to be driving that. Uh, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about my, my story, and so I was going to touch on four topics, and then we can do questions. I was going to tell you about how I ended up in this country. Uh, I was going to tell you about my big idea and how I started my company, uh, how I got involved with basketball, and then uh, just how I see the future. Uh, so um, I grew up in, in Bombay, uh, India, and uh, when I was a little boy, I was 10, 11 years old. Uh, it was uh, the middle of the night, and I had my ear uh, plastered uh, to a little uh, transistor radio, and I heard these magical words, uh, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. I was listening to the voice of America, and I was listening to the moon landing. Now, this turned out to be a pivotal moment in my life. Uh, I was just a little kid, and I thought to myself, this is unbelievable. Who are these people that were able to take a man, put him in a box, and propel him 250,000 miles to land on a rock flawlessly for the first time? Who are these people? What brilliance, what vision, what creativity, what courage, what perseverance? Who are these people? And I said to myself, I want to be one of them. And that's when I decided I was going to uh, study science and technology, and I wanted to be one of these people and come to America. Now, what's amazing about that story is that back then, the entire NASA space program had less computing capacity than all of us have in our pockets today. It still, it still blows my mind. So that's kind of how I uh, uh, got the notion that I wanted to come to America. Uh, and uh, I applied uh, to, uh, to a school on the East Coast, MIT. Uh, they must have made a mistake in the admissions process because they somehow admitted me. Uh, and in those days, you couldn't uh, convert rupees into dollars. Uh, it, the rupee wasn't a convertible currency. Uh, and so I ended up on uh, the shores of Boston with uh, one semester's tuition and basically $50 uh, in my pocket. Uh, so that's how my, my story started. Uh, now, I wanted to share with you uh, the big idea that I had uh, with which I started my company. Uh, I studied at MIT, I studied at Harvard, uh, studied electrical engineering and computer science, and I was working uh, in uh, the computer business, uh, and I was mostly a hardware engineer. Uh, and I became frustrated with the way that software was done. It seemed like the hardware was always on time, always on budget, and the software just never seemed to get there. So that's when I had my big idea. And the notion was, why, why not do software like hardware is done? So if you look at a computer, you take the top of your PC, there's a back plane or a bus, and you plug cards into it. Uh, now, the way that software has been done is you build an application A, uh, you analyze it, 70 to 80% of the code then was infrastructure code, uh, and then you build the application. You build another application B, you do the same thing, and then you build a bridge to tie A and B together. You build an application C, you build two more bridges. And so you have N applications out there, and you basically have N times N minus one, N squared, uh, back and forth bridges to make all these applications connect. So the simple notion I had is just like you have a hardware bus and you plug cards into it, uh, why not have a software bus where through a single interface you could have all of these uh, applications and system communicate and communicate in real time and you convert the n squared problem into the n problem. It saves a lot of money uh, and it provides uh, a lot of benefit. So that was kind of the big, the big idea that I had. And many, many years ago, I uh, managed to talk my way uh, into the office uh, of a guy called Bob Rubin. Uh, and he had just been made uh, in charge of Goldman Sachs. He was the CEO of Goldman Sachs. Uh, so he took pity on me, and he gave me my first contract. And he said, Vivek, I want you to apply this idea to my trading floor, uh, because right now it's a mess and I'd never seen a trading floor before, 
and I saw these guys in red suspenders with stacks of these monitors, which were essentially TV monitors uh, on their desk. Uh, and the notion was maybe with my idea, I could uh, take this mess and, and make it uh, a little bit better. So he, he gave me this contract and he said, uh, now what I want you to do is I want you to come back uh, tomorrow and share with my partners what you're going to do. Uh, so I said, sure. Now, of course, three hour time difference, you know, California to, to New York. Uh, and they would have these meetings very early in the morning before the market opened. Uh, it would be like at seven in the morning, which is four o'clock our time. And so I show up there, take the elevator to the top of uh, 85 Broad Street, which is where their building was. Uh, and they had these very lush private rooms where the top partners would meet every morning for breakfast. So here I am, I'm this young punk out of, out of school. I'm the age of most of you here. And I walk into this little dining room and there's five guys sitting there. And these are the five guys who uh, run Wall Street. They're the most powerful guys on Wall Street. And I sit there and Bob looks at me and says, okay, tell my partners what you're going to do. So I started uh, talking and then the door opens and this guy walks in and Bob waves him away. He says, go on. So I start walking, uh, talking again and then the door opens again and some guy walks in and he waves him away. And the third time it happens, he tells me, son, you gotta stop tapping your feet. So I was so nervous that I kept going like that with my feet. And every time I did that, uh, it would, there was a switch under the carpet and it would summon the waiter. <laughs> so, so that was my first day as an entrepreneur, but it, <laughs> it, it, it worked out well. And you know, I, I built a, a company, uh, Digitized Wall Street, uh, and then I started Tipco and uh, had, uh, you know, I've always been able to surround myself with people uh, that are way smarter than me, and uh, that's uh, led to, uh, to some success uh, as an entrepreneur. Uh, now let me kind of tell you about uh, my involvement uh, with, uh, with basketball. Um, I was, you know, my first experience was about 10 years ago, uh, and I had a daughter who was 12 years old. I was a single dad, and I was trying to find ways uh, that I could spend more time with my little girl. And so I foolishly volunteered uh, to coach her basketball team. Now understand that I had never actually touched a basketball in my life. <laughs> I grew up in India, we play cricket over there. And so I had no idea what basketball was about. So the first day I show up uh, to, to be the coach, and there's this huge gym in uh, Redwood City, which is near my house in Atherton, and there's all these different basketball courts. And I look around the room, and there's all these uh, dads who are the other coaches, ex-Division I players, seven feet tall, <laughs> and then there's me. And so then I look at the girls, and I, I find out that I've already been had, where they had something called a draft, and they got all the best kids, and they gave me the girls that nobody else wanted. So I'm standing in front of the girls and I'm on the court and I'm like, what do I do now? And so the first day I, I looked at the girls and I, I was just terrified that I was gonna make a complete fool of myself in front of my little girl. And that's, as a dad, that's the worst thing you can do. And so I looked and I said, girls, today we're gonna to run. <laughs> so for the whole hour, I just made them run up and down the court. <laughs> And that was kind of my start in basketball. Well, what happened is I, I went back and one of the things about me is that I'm really, I hate to lose. And I said, I can't, you know, this is, I, I gotta figure out a way that I'm not gonna lose. And I studied the game and I'm a bit of a math nerd. And I went back and I converted the game into a math equation. And, and I'll be happy to share this equation with anyone. <laughs> so, made the game into an equation, and I actually taught the girls the, the math equation and ended up winning every single game 
and taking the team to the national championship. And so that's how my love for basketball started, and I just fell in, in love with the game. Uh, and if you, for any of you who've read Malcolm Gladwell's books, his latest book, David and Goliath, is based on this story, and the first chapter talks about this, uh, this story. Uh, now, uh, a few years later, uh, a friend and a neighbor of mine was in the process of uh, buying uh, the Golden State Warriors uh, and was bidding against a guy called Larry Ellison uh, for the team. Uh, he's a little company called Oracle. And uh, so Joe asked me to join him uh, in, in that process. And so I ended up uh, joining Joe, and he was the lead guy on it. Uh, and we ended up uh, winning uh, the bid and, and buying uh, the Warriors. And uh, I was kind of in the back, in the back seat. I, I was the vice chairman, but I watched this team, and it, w it was a great experience. And then a couple of years later, uh, I got a call from the mayor of Sacramento, Kevin Johnson, uh, who's just a very persuasive guy. And he called me up and he said, look, you know, you need to keep the team because this guy, Steve Bomber, is going to buy the team and move it to Seattle. And I was uh, extremely uh, skeptical. I said, well, why would I do that? I live in the Bay Area. I, you know, I love the Warriors. And uh, we're just in the process of turning the team around. And he kept uh, hammering at me. Uh, and at some point, uh, something in me clicked. Uh, I came to California with, with nothing. So everything I have, uh, I owe uh, to the state of California. Uh, and I realized that without a basketball team, the city would be decimated. Uh, this goes back thousands of years to Roman times where Cities were built around coliseums. Uh, and so something in me clicked, and I, I said to the mayor, OK, I'm going to help keep the team. And of course, you know, ended up buying uh, the Kings, and, 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 here, and here I am. So, uh, so that's kind of a little bit about my story. Uh, I wanted to share some thoughts uh, about the future as I see it, uh, and what I see as the forces uh, that are shaping the future, and what uh, types of opportunities this, this creates uh, for all of us. Uh, I think we're living in an incredibly uh, exciting time, uh, and we're entering a, a new era. And I call this era uh, Civilization uh, 3.0. Uh, civilization 1.0 was the start of uh, modern uh, civilization, uh, and it was really uh, driven by the agrarian revolution, uh, and people were farmers and shopkeepers and carpenters and painters. Uh, it was the age uh, of the artisan. Now, with the Industrial Revolution, we saw the uh, ushering in of Civilization 2.0, uh, and it became the age of the corporation, uh, and it was all about corporate efficiency. We're now living in a time when the world's largest uh, seller of books doesn't have any bookstores, and the world's largest seller of music doesn't have any music stores, and the world's largest hotel doesn't have any hotel rooms, and the world's largest taxi company owns no cars, you know, and I can go on. So we're living in a really interesting time, and it's kind of the age of extreme service. And in some ways, it's back to the future, where you have platforms and you have individual contributors, uh, and uh, every business actually ends up looking like a basketball team, where it's a social network on the one hand, and there's perishable inventory on the other, and, and how do you tie those to, together? So when you think about it, you say, okay, so what are the forces that are shaping the new century, and what are the forces that we have to harness uh, in order to thrive in this uh, Civilization 3.0? And so I believe there's, there's five forces that one has to think about uh, as, as you think about the future. Uh, so the first is the explosion of data. If you look at the amount of data that was created from the beginning of mankind till, say, a year or two ago, and you call that x, then in the last year and a half, there's been 10x that data created. Today, there'll be more content put up on YouTube than Hollywood created in its entire history. So the amount of data is just going 
exponentially up, and that's the first force. Uh, the second force is the rise of mobile computing. It took 100 years for there to be a billion landline phones. It took 10 years for there to be a billion cell phones. And it took just one year for there to be a billion smart cell phones. There's now more mobile devices on the planet than there are toothbrushes. And it's only a matter of time before billions and billions of people have more computing capability in their pockets than, as I said, NASA had when it put man on the moon. So that's the second force. The third is the emergence of platforms. Uh, and these are platforms like YouTube and Facebook and I, I, the iPhone App Store, Twitter, where you don't have to be a large corporation to reach large audiences. Uh, any individual now can reach massive audiences by leveraging these platforms. The fourth is the rise of the Asian economies. Uh, a few hundred years ago, uh, China and India were about two-thirds of the world economy. And most economists predict that in this century, uh, we'll revert to that situation at some point. And the fifth and final force is what I refer to as, as math trumping science. So if the 20th century was the science century, the century of science, then I believe that the 21st century will be the century of math. And what I mean by that is that now um, you don't really have to know the why, you simply have to know the what. So when research scientists were trying to figure out how the AIDS virus mutated, uh, they spent years and years and years and they couldn't figure it out. They then converted it into a math problem, put it into a game called Fold It, and within a week, gamers had found the solution. So you simply have to find the pattern. If A happens and B happens, then there's a high likelihood that C will happen. So what is the pattern? Uh, in my own business, I had a customer in, in Europe, and it was a large uh, retailer. And they were trying to solve uh, the problem of credit card fraud. Now, you don't want to be too stringent about it, because then you'll turn away a lot of good customers. Uh, and they spent millions and millions of dollars trying to fight the problem, and they were either too stringent or not stringent enough, and they could never figure it out. So we looked at it as a math problem, and we looked for the pattern. And it was really interesting. What we found is that if you bought champagne, razor blades, and diapers, it was probably a stolen credit card. <laughs> now, you can try to explain the why of it later. And then you say, OK, champagne, a big ticket item, easy to pawn off, makes sense. Razor blades, you know, big ticket item, easy to pawn off, makes sense. Diapers, you know, <laughs> why, why diapers? You know, ah, he's a dad, then you think he's a good guy, you're not going to be suspicious and you can pawn off diapers too. So really, you, know, you see this theme repeating itself where the, you can use math to, to find uh, the pattern, and you know, in that data, the answers lie. And I believe that answers to many of, of mankind's problems, you know, whether it's the water problem we face, or it's disease, or it's security threats, or you know, it's whatever, I think, that if you, there's enough data now that you can actually find the patterns in that data to find those answers. So it's really about channeling, harnessing those five forces and using them to, to create good and, and to solve problems. That's where the opportunities lie. Uh, as I said earlier, I think of every business increasingly looking like a uh, basketball team. And every business looks like a social network on the one hand, and you want to use technology to capture that network, to expand it, to engage it. It's, it's, your, it's your customers, it's, you know, it's your suppliers. And then on the other hand, every business has perishable inventory. So whether you're selling basketball tickets, or clothes, or food, or hospital beds, or hotel rooms, airline seats, consumer electronics, clothes, banking products, they all are perishable. 
and the businesses of the future tie those two together. And the businesses that have really succeeded, they figured out how the cost of supply is zero and the cost of demand is zero, if you look at a company like Uber. And so, you know, so in, those, in the harnessing of those forces, a lot of the opportunities of the future lie. Uh, I think we've seen as much change as we've seen in the last 10 or 15 years, and if you think about it, you know, you don't, uh, all the ways that your life has changed, you know, you, you don't, when was the last time you went to look for a phone booth? You know, when was the last time you went to a blockbuster? You know, when was the last time you pulled up at a gas station and, and you bought a map? Or when was the last time that you made an effort to take your camera somewhere? And then, you know, you look at how the world has changed, you know, where you can push a button on, on your phone and you can have virtually any good or service uh, delivered to your house. You know, your phone goes, your camera goes with you wherever you go. You know, it's, uh, so then you think about all the change and you say, okay, so in 15 years, the years that you guys are going to influence, what is the world going to look like? And I'll submit to you that we're going to have more change than ever in the history of mankind, ever. 85% of all medical diagnoses will be done by a computer program. Most people will be replaced in factories by robots. Driverless cars will no longer be a novelty. They'll be everywhere. Wearables, where they continuously monitor your health, will be a legacy technology, and people will probably have, the, have tattoos that are doing that, that are embedded in you. A UC Davis caliber education will be available to every human being on the planet for free. 80% of the waste that we have today will be eliminated. The planet will be lit up by LEDs. You know, we'll be moving to much more energy efficient ways of lighting up the planet. And they'll all be controlled by uh, in the cloud. You know, I can go on and on, but I think the list is endless. And this is an incredible time to be at UC Davis. It's an incredible time to be a student. And, uh, you know, you guys are lucky to be here. So I'll stop and uh, thank take you. questions. There, there's so many questions that okay. I could ask. I do, have, I do have questions from the audience, but I'm going to uh, get a few of my own in first. So I'm, I'm intrigued. You talk about this rapid period of change, and, and some of your, in uh, one of your earlier books, you talked about uh, the, the critical importance in thinking about intelligence of that ability to anticipate and predict events. So how do you sort of think about that, the importance of that in this atmosphere of incredibly fast change? Is it more important, less critical with big data? Or what, what would you say about that? Yeah, so I, you know, I'm a believer in, and my last book is The Two Second Advantage, where I, you know, the premise on that, about that is that a little bit of the right information beforehand is, is more valuable than all the information in the world six months after. Right. And so if you can combine uh, what's happening right now with history, then you're able to anticipate and you're able to, you know, things like power outages should, should be a thing of the past and, you know, we can actually prevent uh, the spread of disease, we can prevent food shortages, you know, there's a lot of problems we can, we can solve uh, with, uh, with predictive uh, technologies. Uh, and the way that technology has evolved and the problems that you can solve, I, I can tell you, and I, you know, I went to MIT as an engineer and I'm sure that your uh, engineering department would say the same thing, that there isn't a serious computer scientist in academia that 15 years ago would have told you that you could have a driverless car. Mm -hmm. You know, that's right. just like mind boggling that you're able to do that. Right. And, but you know, you have neural networks, you know, you have uh, machine learning, and so computers are taking leaps that we never imagined before, and our ability to, to look at different types of data and process it uh, very rapidly uh, allows you to be, you know, to be predictive. Yeah, really improve that. Yeah. yeah. So my other question that we talked about a little bit beforehand is in this same environment, what, what advice would you have for both uh, 
students of management, business students and, and educators in management in this environment? What, what areas do you think we're missing and where do we need to focus in the, in the next 10 years? Yeah, so I think that, and, and Linda and I talked about some of this at, at dinner, that uh, I think people have historically looked at education as being kind of left brain or right brain. Mm -hmm. And you need to kind of cross both of those. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that there's many advantages to uh, a left brain education. Uh, there's just having the ability to think outside the box and, and connect the dots. Mm -hmm. And what I would say is if you can connect the dots, you're not going far enough. You need to go find dots that you can't even connect. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think that you need to have an education that really gives you the ability uh, to, to learn and, uh, because things are going to change. Right. And, and I know, uh, Cyril, so you were saying that you know, in engineering, every seven or eight years, education becomes obsolete. And I think in the future, it'll be even shorter. It'll be every two mm -hmm. or three years. Yeah. Are there aspects of your education that you think helped you develop some of that out-of-the-box thinking, or, or were you born with it, or was it there when you were 10 years old and, and listening to the space landing? Well, I think that uh, one of the things is that I've never been afraid to make a fool of myself, and so I'm not afraid to venture into areas mm. that I have no knowledge in. I started a software company. I was a hardware engineer. Yeah. You know, I, I got involved with basketball. I never touched a basketball in my life. And so a willingness to, to go after the unknown and, and you know, take, take chances yes. and, and learn uh, is, is something that's important. But the thing that I would say to the university is the greatest uh, good you can do for your students is to make it really hard on them and really challenge <laughs> them. And if you don't, then you're insulting them. And many of us are parents, and we have a habit of saying to our kids that, oh, you know, it's so much easier on you. When I was a kid, I had to walk barefoot five miles to school every day, and, and you're spoiled, and you get to take a car. And, and what I say is, look, don't say that to your kids, and don't do that to your students, and don't do that to your employees. Mm -hmm. Because when you do that, what you're saying to them is, look, you know, no matter what you accomplish, I'm better than you because I did it barefoot. And so at my companies, I was always the stupidest guy. I was surrounded by people that were way smarter than me. And so we made it really hard on them. Set the bar really high. Give them big problems. And don't make it too easy. Because if you make it easy, you're telling them that they're really not that good. Right. And they're really good. So, they should, so you should make it hard on them. Yeah, fantastic. So I, I should turn to some questions. So there are several questions here. Uh, about the, the new arena coming to Sacramento. So I'll start with the one in front of me, which is just uh, what do you see as the most challenging aspect of the business development around the arena, either past or future? Yeah, so that, you know, that is kind of a odd, that is a difficult question for an entrepreneur to, to answer because my entire life I've never really thought in terms of challenges or obstacles. And so I'm always thinking in terms of you know, how we can create something great. Mm -hmm. And so there, I'm sure that there's been challenges, uh, but I think that mostly it's, it's, been, it's been opportunities. And yeah. you know, we have this vision uh, to, uh, at the charter I gave the team was to create, uh, very simply I called it the WBA for the world's best arena. And I wanted it to be iconic. And I wanted it to be on postcards of California. And so then the question becomes, well, what is iconic? You know, how do you, how do you define iconic? And so when you do this with your hands, that's the Transamerica Pyramid. You know, that's iconic. Mm -hmm. You know, when you do this, that's the Sydney Opera House. That's iconic. Yeah. So now when you do this, you know, that's going to be the world's first indoor-outdoor arena. It's going to be the King's Arena. And it's, it's hopefully we're going to deliver on the promise of Iconic. So we're pushing the envelope, you know, in terms of it's going to be the smartest building in the world. It's going to be the greenest. You know, it, the arena's going to check into you. 
Uh, it'll tell you where to park. It'll tell you how to get your seat. Uh, it's going to be ticketless. It's going to be uh, you know, cashless. It's going to be frictionless. And I don't even want to have to have you pull out your phone. As you walk up, it should recognize you and you know, to guide you to your seat. Uh, so we've set a very, very high bar. And I have complete confidence that our team's going to deliver on all these promises. Yeah, fantastic. So uh, another question was another person was asking uh, more about uh, basketball 3.0, and I, I want to ask you about your view, your your sort of theories applied to the game. But also, I know you're also quite interested in in bringing basketball uh, to India. So I'd love to hear more about both of those. Sure. So my uh, the way that I sold the NBA on letting us uh, keep the team in Sacramento and and buying the team uh, was I. Uh, presented this notion of what I called NBA 3.0. Uh, and I said that, look, we're going to make basketball uh, the premier sport of the 21st century. Uh, and uh, it's a sport that lends itself to a, a global fan base. Uh, it's a sport that can be played by boys or by girls, one person, a few people, indoors, outdoors, in cities and villages, rich countries, poor countries. Uh, it doesn't take up a lot of space. You get a lot of exercise. Uh, and so I created this vision of NBA 3.0. And that was driven by three vectors. It was driven by technology. And we're going to use technology to create this global community. It was driven by just having a global outlook from the start. So we have uh, taken our team to China. We're taking it to Mexico uh, this season. Uh, I've taken the commissioner to India, where it's become uh, one of the fastest growing sports. And then the third was we've had this notion that it should be about more than basketball, and it should be an agent of good and an agent of change in the community. So using uh, those vectors, uh, we are putting a lot of wood behind the uh, kind of the globalization and the arrow of taking basketball and sharing uh, the, the joy of this incredible sport uh, and how it unifies people. And, and really, you think about the basketball arena, it's the 21st century uh, communal fireplace. You know, it's where everybody gathers uh, to enjoy uh, some great uh, you know, s uh, sport. Uh, so we're combining all that into, into this vision of, of NBA 3.0. Okay, terrific. So another question about basketball and the Kings is uh, this person asked what, is, they asked, what is the most important to you on a daily basis with the Kings? Is it the uh, business operations, or is it personnel and strategizing about the team, or is it the arena financing? What's, what's your, your main uh, focus these days? What makes, you know, what makes sport and basketball so very different than any other type of business is that, uh, well, first of all, you know, the bi biggest misconception is that I own the team. I actually don't own the team. You know, the team belongs to the fans. It belongs to the city. It belongs to the community. Uh, so that uh, puts your perspective in a, in a very different place. You know, the second difference is if you have any other kind of business, you know, you have a bank or you, know, you sell computers or you, know, you sell clothes, you have customers. A basketball team? has fans. Fans will paint their face purple. Fans will evangelize 24-7 about their team. And so really, our focus is on how do we serve those fans? You know, how do we serve them in the arena, outside the arena, you know, during games, you know, when there's no games, okay. uh, when we create the new arena? And so we try to never lose sight that we do have the greatest fans in the world, and how do we give them what they deserve? Yeah. Great. So this is a question that, um, uh, this is one that our career services director would be proud of. Uh, this person wants to know, what would be the best way for someone very knowledgeable about the sport to get a position in the basketball operations of an NBA team? <laughs> Maybe more generally, what, you know, yeah. what impresses you with young people who are, are looking for uh, you know, a job in your industry or organization? Yeah, so we did something very uh, uh, interesting uh, last season where we actually used crowdsourcing uh, to, to get a lot of ideas. Mm. Uh, and 
we actually use a, a lot of big data in our analysis. And so we use technology and data both in the business side. And so, you know, if you're sitting and you tweet that you had cold pizza, then, you know, we want to be able to pick that up and then go back and really understand you and your household. And, you know, we have, it's the fourth quarter and we've got excess hot dogs. And uh, you just tweeted you had cold pizza. We know that your kids like hot dogs. And those hot dogs will go bad anyways. And so come give you some hot dogs. You're coming to the next game. You don't have parking for that game. We have excess parking, give you some free parking. So even before you have a chance to become unhappy, we make you happy. And so you know, we use it extensively on the business side. But then there's also the use of, of big data on, on the basketball side. And we can use that extensively. And so whether it's with the draft where you can use neural networks and machine learning software uh, to be able to predict that you have this rookie. Uh, so in three years, what NBA player might he resemble? And what's the f floor on him? And what's the ceiling on him? Uh, now, you can also use it uh, now. Every arena has six overhead cameras. And so we have more data now than you've ever had in the history of the game. You know, we have 30, 40, 50 gigabytes of data. Uh, and so the, one of the examples of how we applied it is we signed a player, Rudy Gay. And people said that, well, if you look at one data point, you say, well, he's scoring you know, 23 points a game. And you say, well, that's great. Give him a lot of money. It's worth it. And then you look at the next data point, and well, he's shooting 30%. And well, he's very inefficient. And so, no, don't get him. So what we did is we looked at uh, this spatial data. And we looked at uh, multiple years of data. And we came to the conclusion that with the right spacing uh, on the court, because we now have time-space data, and going from being the second op the first option to being the third option in, in taking a shot, that he would take five fewer shots. And he would actually be much more efficient. And of course, history showed that it was all true. And so he mm -hmm. you know, is scoring the same number of points, but his shooting percentage has gone up 15, 20 percentage points. So, so share, give us your ideas, you know, share your knowledge. Uh, and we're very open to receiving ideas. And those people that are able to do that, you know, we'd love to have them uh, to hel uh, help us and, and join, uh, join our organization. We're looking for the smartest people out there. All right. So in talking about the, the many uses of, of big data and real-time computing, I wonder if you've encountered a difference between people who, who understand big data and understand really how it can be put to use in a particular business. And you touched on that a little bit. But that's something at the School of Management, lots of our faculty are interested in, how to train students, not just for the basics of big data, but really to see those uses. How do you develop that, or how do you find people who can do that? And I think you know that's an area that uh, is going to explode, uh, because I would submit that, you know, as I said, math is trumping science, and every problem is a big data problem. Uh, and uh, the ability to, uh, to, to look at different classes of problems uh, and apply big data uh, to those problems. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, I, and I'm investing in companies that are doing that. And you know, the agriculture, right, we have a water shortage. And right now, uh, most of the water that goes into a field is, is wasted. And so with satellite data, how can you look at every single plant and figure out you know, how much, wh where should the water go and how much water should go there. And so we live at a time when you know, this field is, is, is going to simply explode and we don't have enough people uh, that have that kind, uh, that way of thinking. And so that's why I said kind of you need both the left brain and the right brain and, and you need you know, some of the discipline. But you don't really need to be a mathematician in order to be able to understand you know, how to creatively apply it. Right, yeah. So uh, speaking of left and right brain, a, a question in a different direction. Uh, this question is, why should you include art in the stadium project? Yeah, so I, you know, along with kind of the uh, notion of Civilization 3.0, uh, you know, I started challenging um, people on, uh, on what is City 3.0, and you know, today at dinner, I, I challenged the chancellor on what is UC 3.0. <laughs> and 
and so city 1.0 you know was kind of a place for people to live right that was modern cities people came together it was a place for people to live and um, and with the industrial revolution we had city 2.0 where people started moving out of cities and into suburbs and cities uh, became a place uh, for people to to work and they were living in the suburbs and they were gathering in in malls so now what does city 3.0 look like and the residents of civilization 3.0 you guys you know tend to be urbanites and so city 3.0 is cities are going to be places to live you know to work to to play uh, to to watch sports to enjoy culture to look at art you know to, to enjoy music uh, and city 1.0 was was around a river and then city 2.0 you know is airport access and city 3.0 it's going to be web access internet access you know information access uh, so you know cities are going to be the the places where there's there's opportunity and there's art and there's culture and there's sports and so as we were building the arena we're doing more than building the arena we're building the area around it and it's going to be much larger than LA Live. And so we see this as being uh, critical to uh, the vision of city uh, 3.0. And you know, it's going to be the place for ideas and art and culture and sports and, and you know, the communal gathering place. Uh, so in our mind, you know, art was, was critical to that. Uh, now, I will share a little secret uh, with you guys that there's a piece of art that uh, I've personally been in love with for many years. Uh, it's called The Coloring Book by Jeff Koons. And uh, my thought had been when I was uh, uh, the corner of the Warriors uh, that uh, I was going to figure out a way to, to buy a coloring book and put it outside the new arena that the Warriors hope to build. Now, of course, I, I, you know, I'm now with the Kings, and, and so we bought the coloring book and you know we did it through you know me and my partners donating money to it uh, and it's it's a Jeff Koons uh, sculpture uh, it'll be the only uh, public display of Jeff Koons anywhere in the world uh, and my hope is that this area becomes a destination point for art as well and you guys are building an incredible new museum here which I'm very excited about uh, you know, you have uh, some amazing uh, collections of art already. Uh, you know, we have the Krakow Museum, uh, and then hopefully, you know, we'll also have our entire uh, downtown be a museum. And so we want to have sculpture and art uh, throughout the mall and throughout the arena. Mm -hmm. So I believe that, you know, it all fits in with our vision of City 3.0. That's great. So, uh, we're getting close to the end of our time. I'm wondering if you, if you allow yourself any time to think about what next. You, you've, you've done so many different things that are all connected, but after the arena and the Kings and the success in Sacramento, do you have any idea for what you might, what you might want to do next? What area? Well, I'm just trying to figure out what I do when I grow up still. So, <laughs> it's, uh, no, I think that you know, I, I fully believe that. For myself, my best days are ahead of me, and you know I'm one of these guys who wakes up every day and is super excited about about the world. And uh, and I know this you know kind of sounds corny, but I can't wait to get up every day and uh, figure out how I can do my part uh, for really uh, impacting and making the world a better place. And I think that uh, this is a time unprecedented time and you know there's going to be more opportunity than we've ever seen before there's going to be more wealth created you know we're going to solve many of mankind's problems uh, and hopefully I'll be able to play some small part in that yeah thank you so much thanks we um, I, you know this has been a pleasure and I think we we need to wrap up tonight we do have as a token of uh, our appreciation we want you to think often of UC Davis and the Graduate School of Management as, as your partners. And so we have, um, I had a, an unusual request this week. We have here for you a gift basket. Oh, thank that you. That includes, um, first of all, some, 
some products from some of our GSM wow, alums great. who make some delicious beverages. But also there is a basketball imprinted oh, with awesome. the GSM logo and signed by Chancellor Katehi and well, myself. Thank, thank you so, so much. Thank, <laughs> you. thank you very thank you. much. Thanks. And also congratulations on, I was just going to say congratulations on the success of the basketball team. Uh, thank you. I think you. that's fantastic. I think we have some so. basketball reps here. Yes, yeah. absolutely. So thank you. Yeah. Thanks, everyone.